And in two weeks, we have another visiting artist, a painter, right? Leslie Smith is presenting in two weeks. So we have a, uh, a long list of, just in the thick of our visiting artist series. So um, Raul Deal said something really interesting with the faculty. Uh, I mean, talking about how activated uh, the third floor kennel work has been these incredible ceramic displays, which I wanted to echo because I walk and see those cases. Uh, it's emailing Ty saying, who are these artists? There's just unbelievable work. And there's an unbelievable conference going on, the NCPA conference, which I'm sure Chris will talk about in a second. But many of the students might remember last spring break, uh, the Southern Graphics Conference was here, which brought printmakers from all over the country and the world to present about their work, which is a tremendous amount of work for the host institutions. Uh, that's happening again. Uh, and, the, and Karen, Chris, and Ty are doing an immense amount of work to bring artists from all over the world to Milwaukee to present, to showcase their work, to turn Milwaukee into an epicenter of contemporary ceramics artists. And as Chris will talk about, but definitely just a show of respect and, and, and for all the work. <laughs> Most of them are teachers, by the way, 
practicing artists, curators that participate in this big uh, conference. Hopefully the weather will be helping a little bit. So I hope during spring break, if you're around, you join around the city and enjoy and, and, and watch the show. In Maya, there is a, a curated uh, jury show of uh, undergrads and grad students, and we have one of our very own former grads that, uh, that it has a piece there, uh, Phyllis Schlesinger, I mispronounced it, okay. Uh, so I get a chance to go and see it. Uh, so I thought it would be wonderful, maybe crazy, because we're very busy to bring an artist right before the beginning of this event, but spring break is next week, and Katie Ross, I thought, would be the perfect person. She's cheap, no, I'm just kidding. She's <laughs> one of our neighbors, right, right in, in Chicago. The person really that's organizing the whole event, because we couldn't take the burden, Karen and I, is actually Zacharias, uh, Paul Zacharias, and he's a faculty at the University of Wisconsin. And he is basically coordinating a lot of this stuff. And he happens to be Katie's former grad student. So just give you an idea of the influence of Katie. I know Katie way back when I just started graduate school in Madison. And I was having a show in Chicago and she invited me over to do a summer course at the Art Institute of Chicago. And, and you were fairly new there yeah. at the time. And it was a wonderful experience. And, uh, 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 and since then we always been seeing each other in conference and stuff like that. Something that always amazed me about Katie is the diversity of work and this, the spectrum of experience, from architectural restoration, to just a potter, to installations, uh, non-fire pieces, the chairs I remember you had in Austin, in, in Texas, in what year, 1990, in, uh, in one of those Encicas, in the 80s. Yeah, and that was in Encica, and it was all modern chairs out in the desert, and, uh, and now, this new work that you're going to invent, uh, venture and see. I encourage you to go and check your website. Uh, it looks pretty updated to me. But uh, she has some pieces that you're not going to be able to see today. So if you put katherineross.com. Katherineross slash artist.com. Artist.com. At the end of the presentation, she's going to put it in the screen so you can copy it. You can see that the spectrum of work and the amount of people that she has worked. When I look at her curriculum beat, it's 12 pages, and that's just sink, uh, shrink a little bit. The amount of reviews and publications of her work, the amount of grants, she's an international artist. She's a member of the uh, uh, Acad Ceramic Academy in Switzerland. Uh, that's a very prestigious membership that you have to be, uh, uh, it's a long process. Uh, but once you get there, uh, you are there with a the big clay fat people, not really. But uh, no, it's, it's a very prestigious, and, and, and she has, uh, when I look at people where they have traveled and exhibited, it tells me a lot about the breadth of experience. She has been in China, she has been in uh, Russia, uh, following her heritage a little bit. Uh, we have common. The world is so small, we were talking about Carlos Rumsi, Tanaka, Peruvian artist, some of you I see here met him. She's related to him through the Chicago line of the German side of the family. So uh, what, what I like about your work too is the relationship of history, the exploration of sculptural practice, that in some ways clay always comes back in some way or another. It's not about clay, it's about human history. So I encourage you to enjoy the presentation and welcome to Ross. Uh, I just just gave you a heart attack. Mine didn't hit my laptop. 
No. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I encourage you all to, to visit uh, any of the NSICA venues this week that you can, and you'll be seeing a lot of NSICA visitors coming through this school to look at the exhibits that are here. They'll all have name tags on, and um, you'll look at name tags and recognize some very famous international ceramic artists as well as students from all over the world, and they're all very willing to talk to, to everyone and share experience, and it's a great place to make uh, a network of colleagues across the world. And, and that's how, how I started building my career was through a network <coughs> based in ceramics through NSICA uh, contact. So it's, it's a really interesting event. And you're, you're really lucky to have it in your hometown. We can never do that in Chicago for a lot of reasons. But anyway, to start, um, what I'm going to do here today is talk about a body of work that I have loosely called in the studio uh, ghost or ghost work for a number of reasons that I'll explain as I go along. Um, the, the culmination of this work uh, will be shown at the Pritzloff building next week. So everything that I show you today, well, <laughs> um, everything that I show you today starts with a little bit earlier work uh, that is the beginning of the conceptual structure for what I'm doing today. And it, it builds and, and all of the work is very different from one another, but you, you'll get an idea of my thought process and how one thing leads to the next and how I got to what I'm doing today, which a lot of people may think if they just see that isolated, it's a very strange body of work. Um, so we'll, we'll get right to it with uh, the beginning. I need to give you a little bit of background information about myself. I grew up in upstate New York near Niagara Falls. Uh, I spent a lot of time at Niagara Falls and Lake Erie. Niagara Falls is this huge, powerful, noisy, uh, deluge of water, and uh, it always struck me as this extremely emotionally charged powerhouse of a place uh, with a lot of interesting nuances that people who live in that area know about. Most other people think of it as the honeymoon capital and a tourist trap, which it is that too, but it's also a place where Almost 400 people a year go there to commit suicide. So it has this real emotional draw, a psychologically charged place. Lake Erie, on the other hand, which Niagara Falls feeds into, is a very quiet body of water. It's different than, than uh, Lake Michigan because it is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, but it can get stormy very quickly. But when I grew up there in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the pollution was so bad that it was declared a dead lake. And it was uh, illegal to go swimming in it. It was uh, this very quiet, peaceful place with this underlying diabolical uh, danger. And as I grew up, I would see the landscape and things out in the natural world that had a psychological presence for me because of the, 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 the way people react to it and the things that people do to the environment. So l later on, as I started art school and uh, got more proficient at, at uh, developing my, my ideas for my work, uh, I started <coughs> understanding myself and how those memories and experience became the basis for my work even today. So we'll get started. So uh, this certainly isn't the earliest work, but this is from the late 90s. Um, early on, I was doing a lot of unfired uh, work out in the landscape. Um, when I was in high school, I worked on a farm uh, that raised livestock and boarded horses. And one of the things we had to do on the farm was to replace the floors in the, in the stable. And this sounds totally unrelated, but it's very related to what I'm doing now. Um, 
traditionally animals live, of course, out in the landscape in the world, and they, they move around on the ground. In farms now, it's an artificial environment for them, and they live in buildings that either have concrete floors or wooden floors, um, and, and sometimes more high-tech floors now. <coughs> those kinds of surfaces are very unnatural to those animals and cause behavioral and psychological problems for those animals. Concrete floors are very hard. It causes a lot of uh, tendon and bone damage. It's very slippery. They're uncomfortable on it, and they don't feel, feel secure. Wooden floors have a little bit of give to it, which is better, but they sound hollow when they're walked upon, and that terrifies a lot of animals, uh, especially the first time they walk across it. When we had to, to replace the floor in the stable, we were putting in a clay floor to replace a wooden floor. And this is, was really my first contact with clay as a material to make something out of. And when we um, unloaded the clay from big dump trucks, and we would have to spend days tamping down the clay into a giant slab that was about six inches thick of moist clay. It was a lot of labor, kind of this really interesting large scale labor. Uh, and then when we were finished, we let the horses in. And I immediately noticed that the horses paused at the door, assuming they were going to be walking on a wood floor, stepped on the clay, and immediately you could see them sink into a relaxed posture. And at that moment, I realized that a raw material can have a psychological or behavioral effect. If it can do that to an animal, it can do that to people. And that was my beginning, the beginning of my interest in making things, and my beginning of uh, being interested in using clay as, as a focus uh, for my work when I went to school. Later on, I started doing uh, architectural restoration, terracotta restoration as, as a side business while I was teaching. And again, I was working very large scale with lots of materials. That was a great way to learn not to be afraid to work big and heavy with a lot of labor. And uh, now I'm, I, I tend to go from really large pieces that are installation based to very small intimate pieces and they move back and forth. Uh, and I can move into those situations very easily because my background in that kind of architectural work, which is very close to being like factory work. Um, from the architectural work, I was uh, introduced to, to tile making and mold making. And in my studio, I switched over to using mostly porcelain. And I became interested in porcelain because of its relationship to water again. Porcelain is always found in places uh, when it's tile, in places where there's a lot of water, like bathrooms. Uh, they make plumbing fixtures out of it, bathroom tiles, swimming pools, surgeries, laboratories, that kind of things that either had a lot of water in it uh, or because they dealt with cleansing or the need to, uh, to purify a situation. So I was interested in the idea of purification and cleansing as a psychological issue, and also uh, the idea of water for its environmental uh, relationships. This piece I made for an NSECA show in the late 90s in Columbus, Ohio. It's called Prophylaxis Hygiene. And at that time, I was reading uh, a lot of philosophy. Uh, just to pass my time, I guess. <laughs> and I, I was interested in a French philosopher uh, named Jean Baudrillard, who wrote a, a, a book called The Transparency of Evil. And in it, there was one chapter where he, he wrote an essay that had to do with his impressions of American culture and how Americans were very preoccupied with the need to sterilize their environments, that they, 
American culture had removed themselves from the natural world. They weren't really part of nature anymore. They were afraid of it, and they always had to be ultra concerned with cleansing, whether it's hand, hand whatever that stuff is, that hand sterilizer, uh, or, or, or constant cleaning. And he, uh, he was a little over the top with his opinions, I think, but it was interesting to hear that point of view that came from Europeans. And I agree with it. And he also uh, premised, which is very true, that, that over-sterilizing one's environment actually causes more disease than it prevents. It causes mutations in bacteria and germs to, to uh, uh, cause them to develop more vir vir virulent and diabolical uh, diseases to develop. So, People who do that tend to cause more problems than they solve. So thinking about that idea, I started collecting uh, hot water bottles at thrift stores, those rubber old bottles, and making molds of them and casting them in porcelain. My, my practice in the studio is usually a, a starting out from uh, one point. I, I make one object and it sits around a long time and I kind of think about it and it, it asks me questions. And if I think the questions are interesting, I, I, I pursue it. So I made one porcelain hot water bottle and I showed it to a lot of people and people told me that it was really beautiful. It was so nice in porcelain. It reminded them of when they were sick and when they were a child and they, their mother gave them a hot water bottle and it comforted them and it was all very nice. And I thought, oh, well that's nice, but it's a little not that interesting to me. But I kept making them because I didn't quite know what to do yet, but I was, it held my interest. The more I made in the studio, when people came back, those same people, and they started to see 50 of them in my studio, they had a very different impression, and they said, there's so many of them, it's, it makes me nervous. It, make, it makes me remember how bad illness can be, and it, it made them anxiety-ridden. And I became very interested in the viewer being able to take the viewer from a moment of tranquility and peace and comfort to the opposite end of the spectrum and making them anxiety ridden uh, and, and uh, allowing them to investigate their own relationship to objects and materials and see where that conversation would go. So in this installation, I painted the walls this green, which was based on uh, institutional green from the early 1900s, uh, hospitals and mental institutions, and uh, placed those uh, hot water bottles on the wall, so it, it referred to this overwhelming uh, presence of illness. And on the floor are these uh, porcelain tiles that I made. They're solid cast, they're bigger and fatter than normal tiles that you would see in architecture. And they're in these round formats. Uh, it worked. Uh, the round ones are, are about a little over four feet in diameter, and they're meant to be like the view through a microscope. And they have uh, glazed, detailed images of uh, cells from a waterborne disease causing bacteria. Uh, there were several of them in the installation. Others, there's a detail of, of one of the cells. <coughs> the others on the tiles on the floor are fragments of the circle with an image of a, of a body in the bath cleansing themselves. So trying to, to accomplish the self-purification. There's another one. Um, I like the, uh, to have an installation where the viewer uh, moves through the space, can't see everything at once, but uh, reads each element like a word in a sentence. And as they move through the space, 
they complete the sentence, complete the paragraph, get to the end of the, the, the narrative, although it's not all that uh, specific a narrative, and come to a conclusion and can go through this uh, period of time physically and in their mind so that their associations and impressions build over a period of time during the visit. I'm going to, how do I go backwards? This one over here? Yeah. Okay, let me go. Now, on this one, in the background on the wall, there's a little uh, faucet handle, those cross porcelain faucet handles. That was a commission I had from Michael Graves, an architect. I had to make doorknobs and faucet handles for the owner of Sotheby's for his new big McMansion. And it was kind of odd because he wanted 90 faucet handles for his house, which seemed like an awful lot of faucets, but I guess it was a big house. But anyway, I liked the faucets, and I kept the molds, and I decided to, to make them, but not put hot and cold on each faucet. Instead, there's a word on each faucet. And the viewer, it's 30 feet long. The viewer has to walk down the length of the gallery to read the, the text on the uh, on the faucet handles and let's see if I can find the cursor. Here it is. Okay, this is what it says on, on the faucet handles is a quote from the, the uh, Transparency of Evil by Jean Baudrillard. And I can never remember it, so I have to read it. It says, bodies are less and less able to count on their own antibodies. They are more and more in need of protection from the outside. <clears throat> Artificial sterilization of all environments must compensate for faltering immuno immunological defenses. Under the reign of the virus, you are destroyed by your own antibodies. Illnesses are generated by the very success of prophylaxis. So in a nutshell, that's what, that's what the installation was about. Um, I was interested for, for a long period of, of time of, uh, about porcelain and uh, its implications and use in uh, our environment. Not so much in the art gallery, but how we live with those materials. Porcelain has a, another um, quality about it that comes from history and its beginnings that, that have to do with the development of porcelain in China, its rediscovery in Europe, Europe under the patronage of royalty that established their own porcelain factories to make dinnerware for purely and only for the use of the royal families initially as a status symbol and as currency. And I'll talk about that later uh, in some, some other work. But, uh, go on. Um, from the prophylaxis hygiene piece, I was continuing to read about uh, illness and how we alter our environment uh, for our own protection or for our own needs. I was thinking about you know, the religious premise that, that we have dominion over the earth and we can use the earth for, for our own needs. Uh, we have control over all of that. And how we have developed uh, new species, uh, new, uh, how we uh, genetically engineered, cloned, uh, changed livestock and changed plant life, uh, GMO foods, those kinds of things in the attempt to feed the world and make things better. There's a lot of various opinions about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, and I'm not so much interested in preaching my own opinions about uh, that practice, although I have it, but I'm interested in having a conversation about it with myself in the studio and with other people. So I did a, a body of very small work for a while that uh, was about how we alter our natural environment. Uh, this is a piece that, that has a code name. The, the code is CAMV35S. 
And that is a code for a genetically engineered plant made by industry that was taken off the market because it was found to be uh, environmentally dangerous. Uh, I did a whole series of these works for, with different, uh, different uh, named for different chemical uh, chemical motivators to make mutations in, in plant and animal cells. The plant leaf on, on this porcelain piece is, is from the camellia flower plant. Camellias are genetically engineered plants, just like uh, roses and tulips are. They've been changed to be more profuse, long-lasting, and beautiful flowers of different colors. Uh, but they are not natural uh, plants in the world. But they, they combine and hybridize with nature. So it's changing the face of the natural environment in the earth, on the earth. I use uh, cabinet grade plywoods and uh, porcelain tile from the tile store and cut it up because I want a relationship to our real world and our homes by, in, by interjecting materials that come from places that we know physically, uh, like the floor and our furniture. The, the other long form on the other side is, is just an abstraction that is an investigation for me about how cells or atoms or anything at an invisible microscopic level can change and mutate. So it looks like the stretching and splitting cell. And I, I did a number of these pieces, but I, I think about these little pieces that I do in the studio as a way for me to develop my ideas. And usually what comes out later is a bigger installation that takes longer to develop. Uh, this is another one of those small pieces titled Chimera. Chimera is a half human, half animal mythological being. But again, it looks like a cell, uh, a cell of uh, uh, two identical cells that are opposites, also black and white. Um, based on the same issues that I was dealing with. Around that same time, a little later, I was asked by the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta to do a piece for their museum. I didn't even know they had a museum, but they do, and it's pretty amazing. Um, but they do shows where they invite artists to make work on a theme that is related to the research they do in their um, laboratories. And it's usually medical research, disease research, uh, and, and research that has to do with social practices uh, where they're looking for ways to make people's lives better and to prevent disease. So they were doing a show about the need for hand washing and for cleansing their environment. So they asked me to do a piece for it. And the curator called me and proposed this, and I said, you know, I don't really believe all that much in hand washing. I think it's fine to wash your hands, but I, don't, I really don't believe in over cleansing all the time. And she said, oh, that's fine, that's fine, but would you, would you do something for this show that is sponsored by a company who makes uh, towel dispensers and soaps for hospitals? It was kind of funny, and I said, well, okay, if you don't mind, that's, that's fine. But what I ended up proposing to them was to make a big pile of porcelain bars of soap that don't function. They don't function realistically. They don't clean anything. But they function psychologically because they present this notion of over-cleansing. And there's a video component to this piece, too. But I proposed that I would make about 1,500 bars of soap, and they would be in a big pile in the museum and the viewers could come, the public could come in, and they could take the soap, take as much as they want, and walk out with it, that it was a giveaway. And I like the idea that somebody would be interested enough to take one of these, put it in their pocket, and take it home, something that they can't really use, but it, may, it, it allows them to have a conversation through this object about the things that they do automatically without thinking much about it. Here's a detail of it. These were made from, off of molds from real bars of soap that I bought and cast in porcelain. 
Here's another detail. So you can see they look just like the real thing, but as soon as you pick it up, you know it, it's not. It's too light. It's, you know, it feels like a teacup. Behind the pile is a video projection that was filmed on an old Bolex movie camera. It's not video. I mean, it is video, but the, the actual filming was, was on a movie camera. So it kind of looks like a 1920s movie that kind of flutters a little bit, and it's, it's uh, rainy, and it's black and white, and there's no sound. And what it is is 10 seconds in very slow motion of hand a wash, two hands washing in the sink with water. And then it fades to black, and then there's 10 seconds of the ocean waves coming to shore. So I explained to the curator that I don't want to teach anybody how to wash their hands. She suggested, and I was horrified, she suggested that I make a series of ceramic sculptures of hands <coughs> describing how to correctly wash your hands. And I said, oh, I really don't want to do that. And then I proposed this other thing that really surprised her, and she was interested in it. And I explained, she, she kind of wanted me to explain it, and I said that I'm interested in the psychological meaning and motivation for cleansing. That cleansing is not only a physical act, but it's an, there, people go through rituals for emotional and psychological cleansing too. So the video, because it's slow motion, it looks like an old movie, it's very dreamlike. That's the instigator for the thoughts about uh, psychology and emotion. So that was that work. Now, back to, to porcelain as a material and its history and meaning. This is uh, probably the most common kind of porcelain object that everybody's familiar with in Western culture. Developed in China, then in, in Europe. They still make these things. Of course, we all know that. Uh, but it's really lost the meaning that it was an, in, initially intended for in the 1700s in Europe as currency and as a status symbol. Um, now these things are, are still purchased and used, but they don't really have anything to do with contemporary culture. We all use Starbucks paper cups and, and uh, travel mugs and all of that stuff. That functions better for us than these things do. Um, but they're still being made, they're still being purchased, but mostly they sit in curio cabinets in, in our grandmother's living rooms and dining rooms and that kind of thing. And sometimes they come out for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the obsolescence of that meaning uh, that that material has conveyed for centuries. Um, cups are used all over the world, certainly, for tea and coffee. In, India, very specific cups were developed a long time ago for use by the untouchables, the lowest class of people in India. These cups were made out of clay. They were fired to such a low temperature, they never became hard and durable and permanent. They were not vitrified. If you put it in a bucket of water, it would disintegrate back into clay and you could remake something out of it. That was done on purpose because untouchables were not allowed to use a cup that some other person from a higher class could use after they did. So these cups had to be disposable. They're one use only. And uh, they're still made today, but a lot of people use them because they've become very popular. And people like that when you pour your tea into one of these cups, that the tea <laughs> starts to dissolve the clay when you drink it. Your, your, your tea is a little gritty from the clay particles in it, but they like that grit uh, as part of the, the ritual. So in all these, these tea stalls on the street, these cups are, are, are one-use disposable cups. Uh, they're sold very cheaply, they're made very quickly, often made by children. Um, and then people drink it and then they throw it on the street, on the ground. And eventually they break down and dissolve back into the environment. 
in a kind of an interesting way. Uh, it's funny though that a number of years ago, uh, the government outlawed these cups, and particularly <coughs> because of the train lines, which is the major mode of transportation across the country. That those cups were sold on the train um, to hold the, the, the tea and coffee, and people would throw them out the window. And all the train lines around the country would have, alongside the tra uh, tracks, would be this, these rows of red clay for the whole length of, it would map out the country, these trails of clay from the dissolved cups. And the new styrofoam and paper cup industry started lobbying the government to get them to buy their product to be used in on public transportation. And I don't know if they paid off the government or what, but the government went along with it and it required all the railroads to use styrofoam and paper cups. Well, that's fine, except that the public was so used to their, their particular practice and ritual they would drink their styrofoam cup of coffee and throw it out the window. But that didn't go away. It didn't absor get absorbed back into the environment. And it caused a worse a pollution problem than the clay ever would, because the clay was part of the environment anyway. So the government re reversed their regulation, and they went back to the clay cups, which is kind of interesting, and I, I kind of like that. Um, so I also see. You know, again, I mentioned that I see the porcelain's um, meaning in many ways obsolete in today's world. That it really isn't a status symbol anymore, although a lot of people still feel that way. It doesn't have that high value that it did in the 1700s. There's a lot of other things that are a lot more valuable. So it's obsolete. And I'm interested in a lot of things that are obsolete in the world. But my beginning point was then to make these traditionally European porcelain cups, but treat them like the Indian cups that were not status symbols, that were for the, the lower castes, that they were, they were not precious anymore. So I made all of these, I don't know, a couple hundred of <coughs> porcelain cups and saucers, but didn't fire them. So that they, they, their function was really removed. You could use it once if you used it carefully. But they became ghosts of their own history. And that was kind of the beginning of the series of work that I, that, that I think of as being about obsolescence and becoming ghosts of their own uh, past and history. <clears throat> So I left the mold lines on the cups to, to reinforce the notion that they're, they're not the real thing, they're duplicates, uh, stand-ins, or ghosts of, of the original objects. Now at the same time, I was still thinking about and reading a lot about uh, how we manipulate our natural world and uh, plants that are manipulated, and I started thinking more more specifically about animals and wanted to find what was the most or, or the first animal that was genetically altered by mankind and it turned out that it was most probably the mule. <laughs> Mules are hybrids, they're, they're not a natural animal, they are a mix of two species. Uh, a horse and a donkey, and their offspring is a mule. Uh, they're sterile because they don't have an even number of chromosomes. Horses have 64 chromosomes. Donkeys have 62. Their offspring has 63, and that makes them sterile. They would not uh, breed with one another in the natural world. They would only do it if there's no other options. Uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to, to be completely responsible for an animal's life that only exists for my purpose? It would never exist in nature. So I found the most rare breed of mule in the world and bought her. And this is her. She's a, a, a cross between an ancient Poitou mule, a donkey from France from the Middle Ages, 
There's only a couple hundred of them left in the world, and an endangered horse species, the Clydesdale, the big draft uh, horse. And once I got her and was totally responsible for everything about her, I got her when she was a baby, I of course knew that it's a herd animal and she would have emotional and behavioral problems unless she had another one of her own species to live with. So I had to buy another one. <laughs> so I bought this one. And uh, he's not as rare, but uh, they get along really well and they keep each other sane. And this is where I start thinking about projects for a long period of time. This project took me 10 years to complete. This is an obsolete animal that has no purpose for existing anymore. It's been replaced during the, the Industrial Revolution by, by motorized vehicles. Uh, they don't do the work that they originally were intended for anymore. They're hobby animals, nothing more. And uh, I thought, well, this animal needs to have something to do, because it's not really living a natural life. I started by just letting them into my studio whenever they wanted to come in, so they could feel comfortable around molds and porcelain objects, not be afraid of them, be interested in them. So, you know, they're very nonchalant about it. And then I also decided to train them in an obsolete practice. And that was the art or the, 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 the discipline of dressage. Dressage was developed during the Middle Ages to train horses for war, to use them as weapons. And they, they are taught very precise movements to attack uh, the, the opposing forces and to protect their riders. Totally obsolete now. Now it's a hobby, it's horse dancing. You know, we all know about that from, from that politician that lost the presidential race, his wife, <laughs> yeah, horse dancing. So anyway, dressage training takes 10 years to train the horse, it's so precise. They are in their seventh year of training, and they're at the point where I can now do collaborations with them with ceramic objects. Uh, here is Willie in uh, an arena that's round, and he's voice trained, so he will walk, trot, and canter when I ask him to. And if I go like this, he goes in that direction. If I go like this, he'll stop and turn around and go the other way. Here I'm asking him to move in the direction that a potter's wheel turns. So it's about that centrifugal movement. And what I'm interested in is seeing how they react to objects that I make. Uh, and how they interact with them. So I set up this line of these unfired uh, cups and saucers. I ask <coughs> him to trot and canter in a circle. When he comes to the cups, he decides what he wants to do with them. He can stop and run away from them. I don't ask him anything. I'm just standing there. Uh, he can step on them, plow right through them. He decided, he moved right through, he didn't pause, and he jumped the cups. And he kept going and going, and he became more and more interested in putting his feet as close to the cups as possible, and he would place his feet right between them. They know exactly where their feet are, so he was kind of playing with these objects. Every time he went over them, you can see his head turn, and he's looking to see what happened. Until at one point, he, he disturbs one and it cracks, and then I ask him to halt, and he just stops, and that's the end of the interaction. Another interaction, and I have these videos that I'll show of these, these interactions at the very end. Uh, this is in their field. I, uh, these are experiments that I'm doing to, to help me decide what kind of an installation I want to do based on these, these uh, experiments or collaborations. This is just a big circle of powdered porcelain. Horses and mules perceive uh, through sight differently than we do. They have a split brain. They, they perceive different things separately through each eye. They also perceive color differently. Black and white, uh, they don't usually like it that at all because they see that as negative space. So they would come up to a circle like this, and to them it looks like a big hole in the ground. 
They won't step on it, but they're curious because to keep themselves safe and to survive in the natural world, they have to understand their environment. That's called the umwelt or their worldview, which is different than ours. So their understanding of these objects is different than our understanding. And they are very interested in investigating it and deciding it, if that's a safe thing that they can move around comfortably in their field. Willie liked to walk up to it and get real close and blow through his nose and raise the dust. I think that's the only way he could understand that it was not a void, that it was a, uh, a material. Then I started casting these spheres in porcelain and placing those objects in the field. They're very interested in them because anytime there's something new in their environment, they go right to it and want to understand it. So uh, they would walk very quickly through them, never touching them with their feet, but touching them with their nose, pushing them, and chain altering their shape, um, softening them, denting them, scratching them. And I kept making more and more, putting them in different parts of the field while they were still wet. They would investigate each one, change them, I would fire them, and then I would make some new ones that were a little bigger, and then the next time bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I brought them back to the studio and figured out, well, now what are we going to do with these? And these are just these little experiments in the studio to kind of figure out what it means to me. And again, it's about, you know, the history of porcelain and the obsolescence of the material and how different species read materials and make sense of them in their world. But I really wasn't happy with this really formal presentation of them. But I really liked the abstract softness and the record of interaction in these spheres. Um, here's a detail of this cup form. This was another one I did using a dressage saddle really not satisfied with these as objects too much. But what I decided to do for the show here next week was an uh, installation that I call the Subjective Meadow. And it's about the umwelt, or the worldview, and how different species think about or make sense about objects in their environment. And I started making more and more of these spheres that the mules helped me finish. Um, placing them in my studio, making more and more, uh, until I felt that I had enough that I could call it a meadow, uh, in an abstract sense. This is what the ones look like in the studio, so you get a sense of the scale. It started out at about 30 inches. Uh, you can see the grass all over it from them, pushing them around. <coughs> you know, depends on they didn't make it. But uh, this, <laughs> This is the result of my obsession with making these things. Uh, there's over 200 of them in about a uh, 1,500 square foot space. So that's what's going to be in the Fritzloff building along with the videos. Here's another detail of it. Uh, here's my last slide with my website and my email address. I always answer emails. But I want to show you those videos. So he's, he's going to help me put them on. The first one is, is, is like 10 seconds uh, or 20 seconds. The second one's a little longer, so I'll probably just speed through it so you can see a little bit of it. The first one is called Pee Off. Pee Off is a dressage movement for war where the horse is taught to trot in place without moving forward. It's a way to keep opposing marauders away from the rider uh, because there's this dramatic action with the feet so people can't get too close. It's also a way of building energy that they can then ask the horse to propel themselves forward to charge. Um, so here, this, this is a horse, and it's a friend of mine's horse, performing a kiosk over his covered saucer. The horse knows it's there because he saw me put it under his belly, so he can't see it. He's asked to pee off, but because he knows it's there, he's trying to avoid it. And his movements get more and more active or awkward until he loses his place and isn't sure where he is anymore, and you'll see what happens here. 
back too. That's a way of paying attention to what's happening behind them. So what's this, what this is doing is teaching me how to look at the materials and objects I make in a different way and make sense of them in my studio and my, uh, my world in a way that allows me or encourages me to make a new kind of work for myself that isn't based on anything in history. Um, and I'm going to continue doing these kind of interactions with them for a while and see where that takes me with the work. But does anybody have questions while we so on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm really sure how to ask it, so I'm going to really try. Okay. Um, you, you talk, uh, you reference uh, Jean Baudrillard a lot, and, uh, which, which is awesome to me. Um, and specifically in some of your pieces like the faucets and the soap and you know you're talking about man living in the unnatural and uh, something somewhat hyper real which kind of has references to uh, George Louis Borges. Uh, I wonder if you're thinking about the simulacrum at all. Yeah. Yeah it, it seems because that's how it seems. You know uh, this goes to black and then something else to come on. But, um, I start reading theory and philosophy and then I stop because then I start looking at other people's work that, that refers to it and, and, and I don't want to do that. I just read it enough so that it sparks a question for me and then I follow that question. But um, I'm not sure quite sure what your question is. I'm not quite sure what my question is. Either I, I guess I'm just asking if, if at all if you're trying to reference those things or 
Because not so much anymore. I think I certainly did very specifically in that prophylaxis hygiene piece. It was very much about uh, uh, Baudrillard's writing and, and his thinking about that subject. After that, it, I, I've been following my own kind of train of thought uh, and, and experience with my relationship to the natural world and, and also how, um, how we really, in many ways, are not a part of nature anymore. We visit it. We go outside and look at it. We go to the Grand Canyon and get out of the car and look at it and then get back in and go to the hotel, that kind of thing. And I have this longing for belonging in the natural world. And I can do that to a certain extent through my relationship with these animals, which is uh, a relationship that's based on a physical interaction and a little bit psychological and emotional, but not, not uh, through, through a, not an intellectual relationship. Because I, I think it's kind of interesting that you're taking these unnatural animals and putting them in an unnatural environment. Yeah, but, but I give them a purpose again, yeah. you know, and, and that's what I'm interested in too. I mean, I could do things, and I might in the future do things with, with dogs or grasshoppers or squirrels or something like that, um, which, which is interesting to me too. But because I've been preoccupied with the idea of obsolescence, these particular animals made sense to me to interact with. Somebody here? I was curious about how you made formal decisions to start with circles um, in this piece. Oh, that was just, you know, wanting to be very simple. So I based it on what every potter knows really well, or every ceramic object, that the building of vessels is always based in the circle, whether it's coil building or the potter's wheel and centrifugal force. You know, it's, it's all based on the, the way that the earth turns in circles and, and seasons rotate. It's just this real simple form that has a, a lot of references, but first for me begins in the learning of the ceramic process. That's all. Uh, you, you titled your talk Ghost. You yeah. said these are ghost objects. I was wondering if you could explore that a little bit more. I, I know you talked about the, the pieces that had kind of uh, ephemeral quality to them and they, they represent something that was. Yeah, I think longer. the ghost is, is a label that references obsolescence and the loss of meaning and the loss of function over history uh, with these materials that I use that have a very long history and still have, have this mythology of value, uh, which as potters, you know, many people are, are ceramic artists, you know, they think, well, porcelain object is worth more, it costs more, it doesn't really, it's still clay, uh, it's, it's, there's not that much difference between it. And it's more of this, this, this historical value when it was used as currency and as a status symbol. So, I mean, that's obsolete and I'm interested in, in that obsolescence and presenting those forms as ghosts of their past that have, that ghosts for me reference something that's lost and no longer there. Oh, You'll see. Oopy, the brown one, every once in a while, will start coming towards the camera and I'll say, get out, get out. Yeah. With, best, with this piece, did the, uh, did they see you place the orbs? Or were they? Yeah, well, you know, I had to, um, I had to tie them to the fence because I would come to the field with my truck with all of them on there and they would come right away to the truck and, and I, I didn't want them to start messing with them until I had them out and could film it. So yeah, they watched me set it up out in the field and then I untied them when the camera was set up and they went right to it every time. And every time I made a new batch, I took it to a different part of the, the, the meadow. Uh, so they wouldn't become too familiar with it and say, oh, I know what that is, I don't need to go investigate anymore. But every time it was a larger size and in a new place, they had to go make sense of it. Um, 
I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the porcelain work of Jeff Koons. He's an awesome oh, artist. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I think it's really interesting because it, uh, it's the kitsch object. He's got all this sexual innuendo in a lot of it, especially the work that was based on, on his wife. Um, I, are you, are you asking about a specific aspect of them? Well, just how you guys both use the same medium, of course. Yeah, but it's so different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is the, 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 the hyper valuable object uh, that he's making, and uh, he's incredibly successful with them, which was. Which is, uh, a good thing, I think, and I think he challenges our need of these familiar objects and their meaning in the world, too, and their value in the world. Those things like those, those animal balloons that he casts and uh, other things based on pitch objects that, that especially artists don't, don't give much value to, usually. Um, I mean, they have, they have a, 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 a cultural value but they're, they're not given um, an, uh, a status in, in our culture uh, that other things are given to. And, and he's, he's turned that upside down, which I think is kind of interesting. A lot of ceramics people don't like this work. <laughs> I, you know, it's fine with me. I like it. So you notice that they move around them and they never touch them with their feet. They don't knock into them. It's all with their nose that they're interested. And she, she's the boss. The females are always the boss because they have to raise the kids. So they're always a higher rank than the males. And every once in a while, she'll claim a patch of these balls and chase them away and not let him come. And she just stays there with them, plays around with them that they're hers, and that he can't come until she's finished with it. I don't know if somebody comes back or if that's the end of the poem. Oh, he comes back again. See, he, she left so now he can come. He would go all the way and wait for his son. It's kind of funny. But they're not glazed, they're fired in, in the installation. People ask me why I don't glaze them to make them prettier. And I'm not interested in them as ceramic objects. I'm interested in them, in them as records of this interaction. And if I glaze them, that record would be gone and hidden under the glaze because you don't see the impressions, the scratches, the indentations so much. Oh, now it's repeating. Okay, go ahead. In a lot of ways for me it is. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I didn't have to own these animals. I can go places and, and interact with somebody else's animals. But I really wanted to live with them night and day and know them in a way that I felt like I could understand uh, their thinking about these objects that I wouldn't have been able to get to if I was just going to somebody else's farm. So yeah, it's a, it's a way that I feel keeps me in the real world. Sometimes the art world is very artificial and can be a little crazy. And this keeps me in the real world, which I don't know why I have a longing for that, but I think. <coughs> No, I think that at some point it might turn into a performance with these animals, but it's really hard to find the right venue. Um, what I'm kind of interested in is finding, every big city has mounted police, and they usually have a stable with an indoor arena. And I, I want to make a deal with a police uh, 
stable to do a public performance in, in an arena, but I don't know what that would be yet. I don't want to I don't want to teach them to do tricks and perform like a circus act. It's not that. So there's a little bit of a safety issue because I have to let them make a lot of decisions. So um, I haven't figured out what that would be yet, but I, I think that's coming. I actually even looked into it for Milwaukee for NC because they do have mounted police. But they're stable, it's just a stable, there's no arena, and it wasn't really a workable kind of place. Anybody else? Uh, what are tracks you using to connect with the art to the object or off the end? Um, part of it is, is an uncomfortable relationship with galleries that are often. Um, and rightfully so, preoccupied with selling to collectors. A lot of collectors are very good, very knowledgeable, and very interesting. But a lot of collectors are also interested in uh, a collection for its status symbol, and seeing that maybe collecting porcelain is a higher status than collecting low wire or whiteware or jet plumes. Jeff Coons is certainly up there in the collector's world, but um, part of it's that. Part of it's my interest in the history of ceramics. I taught history of ceramics classes. I'm real interested in the politics of ceramics and ceramics use as propaganda, particularly in the Soviet Union, propaganda porcelains when the Tsars, back, uh, the Tsars were murdered and their porcelain factory was shut down and then confiscated and used to disseminate propaganda on them, uh, which is really interesting to me. And about the use of ceramics uh, to produce bone china in England, this is interesting and most people don't know this. When the United States government had a, a policy to annihilate the American bison in an effort to are about Native Americans. They were collecting the skeletons of those bison and shipping them to the Staffordshire potteries in Great Britain where they made bone china out of the buffalo bones. <coughs> then they shipped those teacups and saucers back to the United States to sell. People don't know that that's what they're made from, uh, but a lot of Native Americans know that. So I'm interested in the politics of those materials. And I've done a little bit of that that, that has to do with the, uh, Soviet porcelain, and th that works on my website, but it doesn't really connect with this work, so I didn't show it. Anything else? Yeah. Um, like you said, you bounce back and forth between a lot of things over a long period of time, and you kind of reference like that you've done some other You've obviously been doing other stuff besides this. What made you decide to show this? Like, why? Because that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> I mean, that's simply it. Yeah. You know, a long time ago, I did a lot of unfired clay out in the environment. I also uh, built my own house. It's, a it's the only straw bale house in the Midwest, and it's covered with clay and then lime stucco. Uh, the clay comes from where I live, all the land where I live is clay. Uh, so that was a real large scale architectural project uh, that I did and used to do a lot of architectural ceramics, tile murals and that kind of thing. But that was at a time when I needed to do that kind of work to supplement my income. It was really interesting to me. It was technically very challenging, and I learned a lot from it that I've always used in my work up to today. But now I'm most interested in following my very personal uh, issues and, and train of thought. So it, it changes and, and it develops, and I all, I'm always interested in showing what I'm doing right now. Are we done? Thank you so much. Okay, wait, one more. <laughs> uh, when does a, an, an experiment turn in, 
into a project for you? Oh, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And because when I when an experiment tells me that it's I'm not following the right thread. Like those pieces in my studio on the table, I thought, oh, this is going to be it. And then I'd bake it and I'd sit there looking at it, and I would realize, well, this is so formal. And I've seen a lot of other stuff kind of like this. It's not really the aspect of those spheres or a particular <coughs> element that is going in the right direction. So then I, re I, I edit and I eliminate the things that I don't think is working, go back to the things that are interesting to me and try to develop that. And it, it, for each one it develops in a different way. That, it, that's the hard part. Can you talk about the tactics you use when setting up space you're working in a gallery? I know you said you veered away from that, but how do you actually get people to slow down and look at that work. You talked about making people... Some of it is time. in... Um, usually they're in large spaces, and a lot of it has to do with overall views of objects and details. People would see, like those balls from a distance, they look like spheres. But as soon as you start getting close to it, you start seeing the surface details and the the records of the marks on the surface and it draws you closer and draws you into the piece. And then all of a sudden the piece becomes an environment that your body is within. And my hope is that then the viewer can then have a physical reaction or relationship with the piece um, and it draws them physically through the space. Sometimes uh, the objects change throughout the space and you get different or more information from each object as you move through and it leads you through a timeline. The, the subjective meadow doesn't really do that. It's, it's meant to be, present itself as a, an outdoor meadow, as a place, but it's not, it's not a natural meadow, meadow, it's a conceptual or psychological meadow. <coughs> I hope. Okay. This is just kind of Do they miss not having balls in the field? They have balls in their stalls. <laughs> 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 the thing about them is hybrid animals are healthier, stronger, and live longer than either of their parents because they have what's called hybrid vigor. These mules may live to be 50 years old, which is 20 years more than a horse. They're smarter, so they need to be occupied all the time, or they can be destructive or get uh, behavior problems that come out as aggressiveness. So I have big rubber balls that hang in their stalls that they have a personal relationship with. If they want to, they play with it. But often, they come in their stall, and at night, they lean against it. They like to feel it just kind of bouncing against their hip, to know it as another being in their stall. It's physical contact for them. <coughs> so maybe they miss some, but they have those rubber ones in their stall. You can see how an animal could get kind of used to having yeah. paper like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.